Not many of you will know this, but on November 22nd, 2003, an Englishman by the name of Jonathan Peter Wilkinson kicked a drop goal to win the final of the Rugby World Cup with just one minute remaining of extra time. Whilst this moment has scarcely pierced the consciousness of the rugby world and rarely mentioned by English fans or media, it is worth remarking upon for one major reason. It was the only time in the history of the Warwickshire Egg Totting Global Trophy that things kind of went as they always should. Because if we're honest, England should have won every single Rugby World Cup played to date. They have more than doubled the play pool of any other nation, the most professional teams of any side on earth, most of those playing in a consistently thriving domestic league, more money and resources than anybody else, not to mention the sheer prestige of being the historical home of the sport, England have an edge over every rival. They're universally hated in a way normally reserved for actual champions, and yet that one world-shattering wrong footer from Sir Johnny of Wilkinson remains the only time England have ever wretched their name on the trophy they're responsible for creating. So, this begs two questions. One, why haven't England won the World Cup more often? And two, can they set the record straight by producing the least popular result imaginable in Yokohama on November the 2nd this year? Let's begin by answering that first question. Why haven't everyone's least favourite conglomerate of posh thugs won the Webb Ellis Cup more often? Well, simply put, none of it was England's fault. Every four years, some totally external bullshit factor seems to spring up and turn England into a team that never had any chance of ever really winning the World Cup. In 1991, it was the stupid Australians making Will Carling's plucky underdogs bin the successful style of forward-orientated play that got them all the way to the final, and the stupid Wallabies made them, made them, play the kind of fast, free-flowing game that got them to the final. It was their decision completely that England changed the tactics. In 1995, it was Jonah Lomu who was solely responsible for the fact the team's tackling technique resembled a Husky's evening shit being rubbed into a carpet. In 1999, it was the horrendously broken point system that encouraged Yanni De Beer to drop five goals. Honestly, they should just get rid of drop goals completely. They're bullshit and should never even be counted. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, it's different when they did it. You, you, you don't get it. In 2007, it was the biased TMO. Plain and simple, it doesn't matter that he was Australian. He probably had a really great holiday in Bloemfontein as a kid, or he got bitten by Yorkshire Terrier once and held a grudge. He was biased, clear as day. And in 2011, it was dwarf tossing for just being so much fun that the players never had a chance of focusing on beating France. And in 2015, it was either Sam Burgess and his betwixing rugby league twinkle that blinded everybody, or Stuart Lancaster for believing the ridiculous idea that it was possible to create an English rugby squad where everyone isn't a prick. Either way, it was a northerner, and nothing to do with Wales' sheer grit or Australia's comprehensive destruction of their defence. And so, that brings us to 2019, where, almost regardless of results, the thanks or blame will lie at the feet of England's first ever overseas coach, wriggly Tasmanian shitstirrer Eddie Jones. In his time out from fighting international rescue, Jones has now coached four different international teams at what is about to be four different World Cups. When he took the job, he'd recently become best known as the man who plotted Japan's win over South Africa, but he was also the assistant coach of the Springboks themselves when they won the title in 2007, and in another mirror image moment, was the man in the other coach's box for that 2003 final where he was in charge of Australia. Wikipedia trivia aside, Eddie Jones actually makes for a really interesting case study. Jones fits perfectly into the fascinating category of auteur coaches, whereby you can watch their team play without knowing who's in charge and be able to say, oh, they, they play like a so-and-so team. However, unlike the porno passing of a Pat Lamb or Gregor Townsend outfit, or the sheer structure of a Warren Gatlin side, each team under Eddie Jones plays a different way. And yet, there's always a clear streak of the same D, Ed, nay, running through them all. What makes an Eddie Jones team an Eddie Jones team is not the tactics they play, but how they decide on those tactics. Whereas many coaches impose their philosophy on a new team, Jones builds his approach from the ground up by accentuating and adapting elements of what that country is famous for in the rugby world. Whereas Gatlin's metrosexual defence nerds couldn't be more different to the traditional image of a Welsh player, whose passes flowed as freely as their sideburns, 
Eddie Jones' Japan team played like the most Japanese team imaginable. Smaller guys playing wide to wide, a game plan built entirely on speed and skill, getting contact over and done with as quickly as possible. His wallabies were so Australian they might as well have worn corkscrew hats, an attacking game built on skills learned playing other codes as kids, and his Springboks are more South African than a bootleg copy of Chappie on DVD, winning a World Cup through kicking, line-out domination, and sheer shithousery. As such, Eddie Jones' English team is about three cups of tea and a willingness to lapse into cultural stereotyping without apology or repercussion away from being the most English thing you'll ever see. Eddie Jones' England play like they have no opposition. Everyone in front of them is beneath them, no match for the Red Rose machine. After Lancaster made it his life's work to try and turn England into a team that third parties might actually like, Jones just screamed, <laughs> England's USP as a rugby team is that everybody hates them. The only place where the English are less popular than a Rugby World Cup is Eurovision. So Jones doubled down. The likes of Mauro Toje are encouraged to be bell ends to wind the opposition up, and then when they're suitably riled up, England strike with remarkable accuracy. If England have a plan, they fire into it straight away. They push ahead with sheer Brexit level bloody mindedness. Jones has adapted and evolved how England play over his time in charge but the one thing that hasn't changed is just how they go about their work. Regardless of the game plan itself, it feels like England are smacking you in the skull with it over and over again. Even if that game plan involves subtlety and skills, those deft touches to an opposition feel less like a brush with silk, and more like being hit with a brick made of hangovers. In this year's Six Nations, against Ireland and France, this worked remarkably well. England deployed a kicking game with Uge and Henshaw gun walkabout, forcing the two teams to surrender so much territory to England you'd think is a 16th century. Except, when faced of a Welsh team whose back three boasted the greatest amount of airborne confidence you'll see without sitting next to Jellypod sex squad on an airplane. England changed nothing. Even in the second half, when they could see that Liam Williams was under every high ball like he was magnetically drawn to it, they continued to kick. This blew up in their face and led to their one defeat of the championship. It did, however, prompt them to pull plan B. On average, England passed almost twice as many times in the last two games as they did in the first three. In fact, England passed more in the Scotland game than they have at all in any game under Eddie Jones. This might be a reaction or it might be that this was Eddie's plan all along. After three games working on one game plan, they were always going to spend the next two working on another with the intention of putting it all together in Japan. As I've previously discussed elsewhere on the channel, Eddie's England has mostly pressured other teams into conceding rather than constructing tries themselves, but this Six Nations they look to learn to build in different styles. And we almost always get to see how they do this, because tactically, Jones likes to front load the match. Whereas some coaches let ideas and set plays sneak out over 80, Jones dumps everything he has, not just in the first 40, but most often in the first 10. If England have ideas, they spring them right away. I've talked about these examples individually in more detail over the course of the Autumn and the Six Nations on the channel, but England noticed Damien McKenzie's positioning slides about, so they tried to catch him off guard in the first play. They noticed Ireland like to take their time, so they start the game a million miles an hour. They noticed Uge is a useless prick, so they kick the ball to where he should be the first time they touch it. And then there are other examples that didn't profit so obviously. Having seen how he struggled against France after making mistakes early on, England spent the first 15 against Wales flying up to attack Anscombe with the speed and ferocity of a beleaguered mum on a WRU Facebook page. Wales responded by playing everything off nine or skipping to Hadley Parks, and when they did need to pass back to Anscombe to kick, he was deeper than John Lennon's sad teen diaries. On this occasion, Wales were able to parry immediately, but it's likely England will arrive at the World Cup with ideas beyond targeting the opposition 10, which is the oldest tactic in the rugby playbook. The way England play is a challenge, they throw the gauntlet down right away. England's first few minutes is almost like a bad guy speech in a Bond movie. They lock you up, they tell you exactly how they're going to beat you, to crush you, to wipe you away and destroy everything you know and love. Most teams then can't help but be terrified because they know England are capable of doing it, but then, all too often, England make exactly the same mistake so many enemies of 007 have been making for so, so long, and leave the room to let their adversary stage a thrilling escape. If England don't win the World Cup, this is where the scapegoating may land, because England have become the world's greatest and most frequent victims of the comeback. Whilst they are so often world class in the first half, England have a heavy handed habit of tossing away leads as games go on. England have played 40 tests under Eddie Jones, and they've won 31 of them. However, more impressive still is the fact that England have led at some stage in 38 of the 40 games. The only two outliers being the William Wallace orgasm at Murrayfield and the St Paddy's Day Grand Slam decider against Ireland, both during the 2018 Six Nations, and both games against supercharged teams tearing into the English with an emotional edge that counteracted any pre-game calculations by Jones. However, the real takeaway from this is that England have, seven times, six of them in the last 18 months, 
gone on to lose or draw from a winning position. Taking the point at which England were either furthest ahead or closer to the opposition's lead in each of those nine non-wins, England throw away an average lead of 13.14 points in every game they lose or draw. Three times in the last year, England have been three scores or more up and still managed to not win. This isn't even taking into account games like Wales in 2016 and 18 or the two games against Argentina in 2017 where England managed to hold on to a win despite comebacks after the game looked settled. In fact, just to screw things up and give us a really alarming artificial statistic, I'm going to add in those games where the opposition at one stage were several scores down but eventually finished within six points and take out the matches against opposition where England have never lost, leaving just the teams who England are likely to face in the knockout stages, and hence the teams England will need to shut down completely if they want to win that elusive World Writing World Cup. With all this in the equation, England have let this overly kind habit get the better of them in 42.4% of competitive games under Eddie Jones. This stat is admittedly ridiculous and contrived, but it's just a way of proving a couple of points. First off, I did deserve to flukishly pass my maths GCSE by a couple of marks after all, but more importantly, the best time to hit England is right after they've hit you. I don't think anyone really knows why they shut off in the second half, but of the 13 tries England conceded in this year's Six Nations, nine of them came in that final 40. I don't know if this constitutes a weakness, but it's certainly something Eddie Jones will need to fix, and he'll no doubt look to find the most English way possible to do it. Because, as of yet, nobody knows how the Rugby World Cup final on the 2nd of November 2019 is going to go. We're now just weeks away from perhaps one big defining rugby moment that we talked about in videos like this for decades to come. Maybe it'll be another heroic drop goal. Maybe it'll be an incredible solo try, a tackle for the ages. Maybe it'll be something scapegoated that makes this World Cup loss not totally England's fault. Or maybe, just maybe, it'll create a moment in which the overworld works as logically as it should for the second time. Sorry that was a bit longer in coming than usual. Um, I took a full week off, which is a huge honor. I don't think I'll ever get to say again, considering the World Cup's coming up very soon. Um, so that was number 15 in an ongoing series on every team in this year's Rugby World Cup. There's five still to go. There's Samoa, New Zealand, Japan, Australia, and Russia. Um, so those are coming up very soon on this very channel. Um, if you want to stick with it, thank you to everyone that supports me on Patreon that allows me to continue doing this. Um, and thank you as well to the first people from the Find a Player app who managed to meet up in London earlier this week and they played tennis together, they played doubles together. So if you want to be part of that, if you want to meet up with random people and play some sport, then you can do that using the Find a Player app. If you want to head there. In the meantime as well, I just want to say that joke you made when you saw the video's title before you'd even watched it, where you saw the video's title and you just said... No. Really funny.